Zenith Finger. Uh, by the way, Chris, do, do you want to make yes. a co-host? Yes. A, yeah. Uh, Alexa just turned it on. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, I see it now. Okay. Oh, yeah, so you should make sure that the people, I mean, the, the people from the panel that are not actually speaking or presenting, that they are on mute because of uh, background noise that, that yeah, they should really get otherwise. Should we get started, Chris? Yes, very good. I'm good to go. Well then, good afternoon. Well, depending on your time zone, it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Serge Fehr. I'm a member of the CWI Crypto Group. And together with uh, Christian Schaffner from the University of Amsterdam and QSOF, would like to heartily welcome you to QCrypt 2020, the 10th anniversary edition, 
of the annual conference on quantum cryptography. So, sorry, I was uh, missing that. I guess it's my turn. So what you wanted uh, for QCrypt 2020, you can see on these nice pictures, it's actually a very beautiful day here in, uh, here in Amsterdam. Uh, it's summertime and we have lots of nice bridges, uh, canals, bikes. But yeah, we, we all know uh, and experienced that over the last uh, few months uh, with the pandemic. So uh, things are online now and uh, here's what you get instead. Indeed, unfortunately, this is what you get. Huh? So cats uh, scrolling over your keyboard, kids yelling in the background, uh, internet connections breaking, you name it. Huh? Well, <clears throat> still fortunately being forced to have the conference online, it has no impact on the scientific quality of the conference as, as you will experience yourself uh, uh, during this week. Also having the conference online makes it more accessible, makes it accessible to a larger crowd. I'll say more about that a bit later. Indeed, we have an exciting program ahead of us. Um, as usual, we have a, a mix of uh, contributor talks, uh, about 30 of them. Uh, speakers have already pre-recorded uh, their full talks, 20 to 25 minutes. You can find them linked from our website and on YouTube. Um, but as usual, we will also have uh, quite a lot of invited talks. The first one to follow right after by Anthony Leverrier. We're going to have uh, four tutorial talks that are a bit longer and introduce us to, to new topics. We're also going to have two poster sessions, uh, one on Tuesday afternoon and one Thursday morning, as well as an industry session on Wednesday morning, where we have five speakers and we're going to have some panel discussion. And uh, also, as usual, at QCrypt, um, we have kind of an exhibition. This time, uh, it's more a, a sponsor uh, exhibition. So much of the program was put together by the program committee. So the program committee this year was chaired by uh, Fred Dupuy and co-chaired by Fai Hung Su. The PC, the program committee, selected all the contributed talks by means of a careful reviewing and selection procedure, as, as is the case in every year for QCRIP. Uh, but more details about this you will hear during the business meeting, which takes place on Thursday afternoon. So the whole uh, conference is going to take place basically on four platforms. Um, so first of all, we're going to have the Zoom webinar, where I see already 144 of you uh, have found the way to. Um, that's where we're going to hold the uh, scientific presentations. Um, we also stream everything to YouTube. So there's a YouTube channel where you can watch this uh, uh, live and where it will also be recorded and uh, available for a later review. Then we have a Slack channel where you can participate. We have uh, one uh, channel per session. You can discuss, discuss uh, things there while it's happening, but also mainly afterwards. So the, the speakers of the sessions, they are uh, asked to, to visit the Slack channel afterwards and maybe pick up on things that have been happening there while they were away. So we want them to focus on their presentations in the Zoom webinar. But after that, you can also find them in our uh, virtual meet and greet room. Um, so this is a bit of an experiment, but um, we try to kind of emulate the conference atmosphere by having this website where you can walk around and you can sit uh, with a bunch of people around the table and also have a video chat with them. So this will be open during all the breaks and actually has been open right before the conference has started and it will be available at the end of the day uh, every day. Furthermore, um, follow us on Twitter. So if you tweet, use the hashtag uh, QCrypt2020. And also we have, a, we have a Twitter handle, QCryptC for QCrypt Conference. And uh, all the details you can find on our uh, website. Yes. So we hope that all these different platforms are going to run smoothly uh, so that you have a nice uh, online conference experience. If not, if you still, if you need some technical help, there are different ways to reach out to us. Uh, as well, you can see here, you can drop us a message on the Slack help desk channel. You can send an email to our help desk email address, or somewhat more personally, you can visit us 
at the help desk in the meet and greet room, which you find on, on the third floor. So by participating in uh, QCrypt and um, attending it, uh, you uh, agree to follow the code of conduct, which we outline also on the web page. And we have added some paragraphs um, for online conferences. In particular, we want you to represent yourselves by your correct full name, so the professional name that you use and that you put on your uh, articles. And then in general, we, we want to contribute in a responsible and non discriminatory uh, manner. In case you, you notice any uh, inappropriate behavior, please send us an email to this email address, or you can also call one of the code of conduct liaison persons that we list on the website. So, as already mentioned, having the conference online has the advantage of making it much easier and much cheaper as well for you, for you all, to attend the conference. Uh, this is well reflected in the number of participants that, that we have uh, so far. Indeed, as of uh, this morning, we have a proud number of 958 uh, uh, attendees that have registered uh, to, to the conference. We also collected a little bit of statistics. So here uh, you can see um, what people describe themselves. So half of them roughly consider themselves theorists and the other half experiments, if you also count the ones that say that they are both. And I think this is pretty much uh, as usual at the, uh, and the same or similar to previous editions of QCrypt. Yeah, we also had a look at the geographical distribution of the participants. And so here you can see sort of judging from, from the time zones that were indicated when they're registering, about a third of the participants come from sort of Central Europe, about a third from, from China, India, Japan, part of, of Asia, and one fifth from the US and, and Canada. Well, there are a few percentages left. So those, I guess, come from both the rest of the world. And as we also got used to it uh, with time zones, things can be tricky. Um, so when we start in the morning and at 11 uh, tomorrow, then yeah, this is kind of a reasonable time for some parts of the world. But if you're uh, at the West Coast uh, on Pacific time in the US, then this is very early in the morning. So probably not too many people from uh, California uh, to be expected then. And when we finish in the evening uh, at five, um, that's uh, in the middle of the night uh, in, in Asia, in, in Japan, for instance. So um, yeah, I guess this is what we have been used to over the last uh, few months, uh, handling time zones. Um, yeah, that's also gonna be part of this conference. Now we'd also like to use this opportunity to thank uh, our sponsors for their generous support. Uh, the two gold sponsors we would like to thank are, are the physical review journals from the American Physical Society and QSC, which is a, a joint project of uh, QSoft, Leiden University, and uh, QTech. Our silver sponsors are CAS QuantumNet, CQT from Singapore, ID Contic, IOP Publishing. Uh, the Jinan Institute of Quantum Technology, Curate. We also have a collective silver sponsorship from QSoft University of Amsterdam, CWI, Europa Bank, and the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, we have uh, Quix as a, as a silver sponsor, as well as Quantum Delft, RMY Electronics, and Single Quantum. And our bronze sponsors are Baidu, Diamant, the Paris Center for Quantum Computing and Very Cloud. We would also like to thank uh, the organizers of last year's QCrypt 2019, so Gilles Brassard, Claude Crepeau, Sébastien Gon, and Louise Alvail, and their institutes, the Uni Université de Montréal, McGill, and UCAM, for uh, transferring the surplus from last year's conference to us so we can build on that. So that's also been a tradition at the previous QCrypts, as we don't really have a, a, a governing body of QCrypt, and it's nice to have some funds transferred from the previous edition to this one. Thank you very much for that.
So as already briefly mentioned, you can visit some of these sponsors in the meet and greet room, simply go to the corresponding sponsor lounge. All the sponsor lounges are, are, are situated on the left of the, of the floor. Uh, you find different sponsors on the different floors and then in the sponsor lounge you can either talk to a representative of the sponsoring institute or company there or just check out their pin board by clicking on the on the whiteboard uh, button in the toolbar once you're in, in the lounge so the participating sponsors are the ones that are uh, listed here so please go and, and, and visit them all right, we don't want to let you wait any longer. Um, however, we do hope that uh, we're going to see you in person again next year, where we are also going to organize this conference, hopefully in person in Amsterdam, and then you will actually get to experience what you can see on these nice pictures here. And so now, without any further ado, let's get started. So in the name of the entire organization committee, we wish you a great online conference. Good to have you all here. And uh, with this, so on, I'm going to hand over to the session chair of the next session, uh, Fred. First. So, hi everyone. Uh, I guess it's my turn to welcome you all to uh, to QCrypt. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to uh, say a few words about the uh, the way you can ask questions. Um, there are two ways in which you can ask questions. Uh, the first one is to use the uh, the question and answer uh, functionality of uh, of Zoom. So you can just type your your question in there. The second way is to uh, to raise your hand. So there's a button somewhere where you can uh, you can raise your hand, and as ch session chair, I'll handle the uh, the questions uh, like this. So without further ado, uh, let's kick off the conference with our first uh, invited talk. So the speaker will be uh, Anthony Laverrier. Anthony is a researcher at the uh, Inria in Paris, and he's going to talk about security proofs for continuous variable uh, quantum key distribution. So. Anthony, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So can you see the slides? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. OK, so thank you, Fred. So first, I would like to thank the, the organizers for putting up this, this, this great event, uh, despite the, the, I mean, the pandemic and, uh, and the tough conditions this year. Um, I would also like to to thank the, the steering committee for giving me the opportunity to, to, talk, to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, continuous variable quantum key distribution, and more precisely, security proof, uh, security proofs for QKD uh, with continuous variables. Um, okay, just a sec. Okay, so first, just some quick uh, disclaimer. So there won't be any joke about, uh, about COVID in my talk, sorry. Um, I won't talk about experimental stuff. It's, it will mostly be focused on, on theory. Um, there exists a huge uh, number of CV continuous variable quantum key distribution protocols out there. Uh, I won't talk about many of them. Uh, in fact, I will only talk about like a couple of them, uh, those which are both simple to describe and simple to, in, to implement. I think it's important to have these two conditions because uh, kind of the, the goal of this of this talk is to uh, is to uh, uh, give a flavor of continuous variable QKD to, to people who don't know about that. Um, as also think that uh, uh, as a field in quantum key distribution, if we really want uh, that this get deployed at large scale in the future, we really want to focus on on protocols which can be implemented easily. Um, uh, and yeah, the talk might contain some controversial statements, um, like, uh, sure, maybe before it's a fine protocol, but I think it's high time that we move to CV protocols. Um, but I won't be too provocative. I will try to, to stay reasonable. Um, OK, so this is the outline of my talk. So first, I will try to, to, to present the difference between discrete variable QKD and continuous variable QKD. So mostly, it will be a comparison between BB84 and CV QKD. Uh, then we'll turn to, to security proofs. And I will try to kind of quickly present what is the state of the art right now of uh, security proofs for CV QKD. Uh, as you will see, it's much less advanced than security proofs for BB84, but still. Uh, we've made a lot of progress 
in the last few years, and I want to talk a bit about that. Uh, and in the final part of my uh, of my talk, I will talk about kind of the next steps. Uh, what are the open questions that remain? There are a few of those, uh, mostly like final size setting. You know, we still have a lot of trouble um, uh, analyzing finite size security for CVQKD and general attacks. Okay, we we kind of understand well uh, some restricted kind of attacks, but if we really want to go to in general, so-called coherent attacks, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay, so this is kind of the outline, the outline of the talk. So, okay, let me start with um, kind of a comparison between discrete and continuous variable QK. So, so yeah, so in my mind, um, QKD, there are like two natural, two simple QKD protocols that exist. Uh, the first one is the one that everybody knows about, uh, BB84. Uh, and maybe I would I like to claim uh, in some somewhat controversial way that this protocol is so natural that it would have been discovered eventually, uh, even without Charlie Bennett and Gilles Brassard. Probably much later, uh, okay, but uh, at some point, this would have been discovered. Uh, it's so nice, so, so beautiful. Uh, I mean, and the idea of the protocol is simply this, no? so you prepare these kind of integrated states, 0, 0, plus one, plus one, one, you give one part to Alice, one part to Bob, and then you ask both Alice and Bob to measure with this, uh, with this POVM, so this measurement with four POVM elements, which are 0, 1, plus or minus. So usually when we present BB84, we say either we measure in a 0, 1 basis or in a plus minus basis, but we can represent the protocol as this. So we can just say that we have both Alice and Bob, they apply this, uh, this measurement described by this, uh, this POVM. So it's very nice. It's as simple as it can get. Uh, so you can do anything simpler than that. So it's beautiful. Um, and I would like to argue that CVQKD, at least one of the CVQKD protocols, is a direct generalization of VB84 uh, in infinite dimension. And it's also very nice. Uh, so what's the generalization? So now you don't want to have like qubits anymore. You want uh, a full Fox space. So um, so it's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space spanned by, uh, so you have a basis, which is the Fox, Fox basis, which is zero, one, two, three. So it's indexed by the integers. Uh, and basically instead of uh, distributing zero, zero plus one, one, what you want to do is to distribute this state. So it's, the natural generalization of, uh, of the zero, zero plus one one state in infinite dimension. So in infinite dimension, you will have like infinitely many terms. So if you want to have something that, uh, that is normalized, you need to, to add this uh, geometric uh, coefficients. So you have zero, zero plus lambda one, one plus lambda square two, two plus lambda to the k, k, k uh, up to infinity. Uh, and this state, you can also write it in this way, in a very nice way. So it's just, uh, you start with a vacuum state, so zero, zero, and you apply uh, this nice operator, which is exponential of lambda times A dagger, B dagger, and A dagger is a so-called creation operator. So it creates a photon. Uh, so it maps zero to one, two to three, with some uh, normalization. And so, a dagger and B dagger, they are creation operators for Alice and Bob spaces. So this state that might look a little bit complicated is very simple. It's just some kind of exponential operator applied to the vacuum. And also you distribute these states and what you do, Alice and Bob, they both measure uh, uh, their part of their subsystem with a kind of the simplest um, measurement that you can do in this Fox space. Uh, which has this uh, POVM decomposition. So just the, the identity and the resolution of the identity is just the integral uh, over the complex plane of this so-called coherent state. So this alpha, uh, this is the projector on the coherent state alpha, which has kind of a somewhat complicated expression if you write it in a Fox space, but if you write it in terms of this, uh, of this creation operator, it has a very simple form. It's just the exponential of alpha uh, a dagger applied to the vacuum. 
Um, so this detection is called coherent detection. It's called heterodyne measurement or sometimes double hemodyne uh, measurement. So what it, it will output is a complex number alpha. Okay, so, so, so the protocol is very simple. So you just distribute this, the copies of, of these states, which are just the natural generalization of the, of the EBT for EPR pairs. Um, and you measure with the simplest uh, uh, measurement that you can do uh, in Fox space, which is this one. And that's it. That's the, uh, the vanilla CQKE protocol. Um, there's an alternative. So, so there's a different CVQKE protocol, which is uh, 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 much studied, where instead of using this uh, heterodyne measurement, you do homodyne detection. So basically you measure either the real part of this alpha or the imaginary part of this alpha. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, at the setup of corresponding to that protocol, it's exactly the setup uh, of the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paper from 35. So when they wanted to kind of uh, argue that quantum mechanics was not complete, they were really looking at exactly that experiment. They were looking at uh, sharing uh, these kind of states and measure, ice and bomb measuring uh, their part of the state with the online detection. So in a sense, uh, somehow CVQKD is very, uh, is very old as well. Of course, it, this was not formalized this way in 35. It was formalized much later, like uh, in the early 2000s by Ralph, Reed, Cerf, Croissants, Grangier, the book. So uh, about 20 years ago. Okay, so, so yeah, so that's what I want to say. So I want to say that to me, there are two very nice and natural pro QKD protocols, which are BB84 and this uh, CVQKD protocol. Uh, BB84 has been studied a lot and, uh, and this CVQKD protocol has not been studied as much. Uh, and I really want to encourage people to, to look at it more closely. Um, okay, so that was, for, that was for the theory. So. What about the practice? Okay, so theory versus practice. Uh, so here I would like to make another um, kind of provocative statement. I would like to say that BBT4 is very nice in theory, but not so much in practice. Uh, why is that? Because really what you want is you, you want to prepare single photons. And usually we don't know how to do that very well. So what people really do, is they kind of prepare this too much squeeze state in general, so the, exactly the same state that we had in the CVQKD protocol, and you measure one of the two subsystems, and if you get a click, uh, then you know that there was a photon present in the first uh, in the first pulse. Uh, another version of BBAT4, which is more experimentally friendly, is to don't use, don't try to use uh, single photons, but directly use coherent states, which is exactly what we use in CVQKD. So both these approaches, uh, they use the same states as in CVQKD. Uh, and when you do that, you, this need, I mean, this, uh, this forces you to kind of redo the, the security analysis because you can have like uh, multiple impulses which can be exploited by the adversary. Okay, so this is the first change between the theory and the practice of BBAD4. Uh, you cannot really prepare these single photons uh, uh, easily. Uh, a second change is that uh, photon counters, they are also hard to implement. So what people do instead is that they replace them by threshold detectors. Okay, and when you do that, so now you, you leave the, the qubit subspace that you would like to, to, to look at for BB84, but you enter into an infinite dimensional Fox space, which is exactly the same as CVQKD. Uh, so my point is that uh, BB84 looks very nice on paper, uh, like uh, as a computer science um, uh, protocol, but when you try to, to, to do it in practice, and then you kind of have states and measurements uh, or and just states that look similar to the ones that we have in CVQKD. Uh, in contrast, uh, uh, for CVQKD, uh, the implementations or the practice is pretty much as, adver as, adver as advertised. Okay, so we have the same states that uh, than the one that are mentioned in the protocol. We use the same measurement as specified. Um, so if I want to be completely honest, there's a small difference. I mean, uh, in the, when we specify the protocol, we assume that you can really measure perfectly um, 
perform this detection perfectly. Uh, it's not quite true. Um, uh, in practice, uh, you will not get an arbitrary alpha, arbitrary complex number, you will get uh, some finite precision. Um, but still, so we use the same state, same measurement as prescribed. Uh, in the prepare and measure version, ALICE prepares coherent states uh, with a Gaussian modulation, meaning that alpha is chosen from this Gaussian distribution. Or sometimes, uh, we'll, as I will explain later, we can just take alpha from a finite set. Uh, so this is very easy to do, and this coherent state is very easy to prepare. Um, so the implementations that we have today of CVQKD, they closely match uh, what uh, the description of the given by the original protocols. And this is not true for BB84. Uh, so my personal bit provocative view is that BB84 was nice to, to launch the field of quantum crypto like 35 years ago. Uh, but I think that the future belongs to CD. Uh, but we can discuss this. Um, Okay, so are there any drawbacks to CQKD? Um, uh, so one possible drawback uh, is the same one that you, uh, you give like in, uh, in shop interviews when people ask you what is uh, a bad, uh, something bad about you. And you say, ah, I'm too hardworking somehow. So yeah, it's the same. So kind of the first drawback of CQKD is that it, this theory is more challenging, okay? so looks bad, uh, but also looks, makes it interesting for theorists. Um, so why is it more challenging? Uh, one reason is that the, the dimension of the space, of the Hilbert space is infinite. So it's not a qubit uh, space. But the same is true uh, for implementations of DVQKD. Um, probably the, the most serious difference between CV and DV is that of course the, the the measurements, uh, they are continuous valued. So they, they are put continuous values, so that's fine. Uh, but really the kind of the difficulty that appears is that the, the measurement operators, they are unbounded. Okay, so when you get this alpha, this complex number, it there's no upper bound on the value of alpha. Okay, so this is very different from qubit protocols where you have zero or ones and that's it. Um, and so the quality of the, correla the, the correlations between Alice and Bob, uh, States, they're not measured like uh, by numbers between zero and one, like uh, the quantum bit error rate or the CHSH score uh, as for discrete variable QKD, but they are measured by uh, something called the coherence matrix of the state, which is unbounded in general. So we don't have, uh, there's no way to kind of give an upper bound on the values of the coherence matrix. Uh, and so this leads to some conceptual difficulties. So the, the proofs that we have for uh, discrete variable QKD, they don't go through uh, in, this, uh, in this framework. Um, but I would like to say that the, I think that the problems, they are very clean. The problems that we get, uh, they are very nice. We just, we have some state and we want to estimate the covariance matrix. Uh, that's a neat problem. Um, Probably a more serious uh, uh, drawback of CVQKD is uh, concerns uh, experimental performance. Okay, so it's kind of clear that uh, CVQKD seems to be less robust to loss uh, than discrete variable QKD. Uh, so, kind of one kind of intuition for why this is the case is that when you have losses uh, in BB84 or in, like in uh, DV protocols, uh, what it means is that the, the photon won't make it to Bob. And so basically the, the, the de Bob's detector won't click. And so you just discard that event. Uh, so that's you have this nice filter that the, 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 the losses are kind of filtered out by no click events. Uh, in CVK, it's not the case. So all the pulses, they, they arrive. Uh, every, there's always something that Bob measures. Uh, simply it will be noisier. So, so most of the time there won't be much signal, but there will be only noise. Uh, and the consequence of this is that it makes it harder to, to estimate the channel parameters precisely and to estimate what is the, the, the state that Alice and Bob share. Uh, and the consequence is that um, because this parameter estimation will be much harder, uh, in general, if you want to, to go to very long distances, you will have to, to measure the the channel parameters very precisely, and this will require very large blocks. 
Okay, so you, you really need very large block size uh, to get to long distance. So you need like uh, setups which are very stable over time, uh, and you need a lot of like uh, uh, classical post processing. So this is really in my in my mind the the big uh, disadvantage of CV compared to discrete variables is really that it's less robust to to loss. But if you want to work at like uh, 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, is I think it's fine. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. So, so, okay. So let me just give you quickly what is the what does the the, the vanilla CVQKD look like? Okay, protocol look like. So, so the prepare and measure version of the CVQKD protocol that I have in mind um, goes like this. So, ICE prepares some coherent states alpha one, alpha two, alpha n, uh, and she sends those to to Bob. So alpha k can either be a Gaussian variable, a random variable, or an element of a finite set. So say like a set with four elements, plus alpha, minus alpha, plus i alpha, minus i alpha. Uh, so this is very simple. Bob measures uh, what he gets with uh, heterodyne detection. So he gets complex numbers, beta one up to beta n. Uh, and typically, uh, if you have like a, uh, an optical fiber between Alice and Bob, and you have no attack, uh, what you will get is that usually beta will be related to, to alpha in the, in the following way. So beta will be equal to T times alpha plus gamma. So T here is just the, a fixed attenuation coefficient that depends on the length of your channel. Uh, so for say 100 kilometers in optical fiber, it will be 0.1. And gamma uh, will be some Gaussian noise. Uh, and the Gaussian noise, uh, so it will be centered Gaussian noise, so zero mean, and the variance of that noise uh, is one. So this is like the, the it's called the shot noise uh, unit. So this is due to the uncertainty principle, plus some excess noise, so this t square uh, xi. So xi is called the, the excess noise, and this is really what uh, plays the role of the Q-bear if you want in uh, in uh, CVQKD. So the way we kind of, um, we we evaluate the, the quality of the correlations between Alice and Bob is through this parameter, C. Uh, in typical implementation, it's like 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two. Uh, and because of this T square, so you can see that this T square C will be like 10 to the minus five at 100 kilometers. and but the noise will have so variance 1.00001. And what you really want to do to kind of uh, estimate this information is to estimate this, this, uh, this small difference between the shot noise and this total noise. Um, okay, so this is the, the quantum part. And then the, you have classical post-processing, which is essentially identical to discrete variable protocols. So you have a key mapping. Um, so here we use Bob's data to, to, to extract a raw key. So it's called reverse reconciliation in some papers. Uh, but really it's the same for BB84 because in BB84 we could say that you use I's data to, to get the key, but it's not quite true um, because you discard, you discard the no key kicker events. So really what you do is you just keep uh, I's data when Bob receives something. Okay, so you have this beta one up to beta n, and you need to find a way to discretize these, these, these complex numbers. So you, you do that, uh, and you get a row key. Uh, and then what you really want to do for the, the parameter estimation is to estimate the covariance matrix of this alpha beta. So informally, what you want to do is to estimate the, the attenuation of the channel and this excess noise. And this is really the most challenging part uh, uh, of the protocol. And then you do privacy amplification as usual. Okay, so it's kind of simple protocol. You prepare these coherent states. Uh, you measure with this uh, heterodyne detection, you get complex numbers. Uh, and then you try to, to extract the key from that. Okay, so what should we use? CV or DV? Uh, so uh, here also I will be a bit uh, kind of provocative, but yeah. So photons, they live in an infinite dimensional Fox space. So why should we encode information in, in some restricted qubit space? That's kind of a weird thing to do. Uh, the simplest states to prepare are the coherent states, which are Gaussian states. 
So those, those are the ones that are used everywhere in the telecom industries. Those are the ones that you have when you have a uh, laser pointer. Uh, so of course you want to use those. So you can use those with BB84, but you need to tweak the protocol to do that. For CD, it's exactly the state that you, you would use in the first place. Uh, what about detection? Uh, I think coherent detection is really uh, kind of the way to go. This is something that the old like telecom industry they are looking uh, they are looking for. They have been uh, working a lot to, to kind of do this because uh, of course if you can do that, it's very interesting also for classical communications. You can like, increase the, um, the the speed of like all classical telecommunications. So there are huge uh, incentives for the telecom industry to work on improving coherent detection. It's not the case for single photon detectors. Um, and I think it's more natural efficient to encode information in phase space. So really what you want to use is continuous variables. So something that people might say, say, okay, but what about all these great uh, things that we invented recently? Uh, in device in in discrete variable QKD. So what about device independent, measurement device independent, twin field QKD? So we know that those don't really work in with CV. So there are like papers that do a bit of measurement device independent with CV, but they don't work as well as in uh, as with discrete variables. Um, okay, fine. So we cannot really do that with CV, but why do we need those in the first place? I mean here, yeah, I would say that kind of the reason we invented these things uh, is really because we didn't know how to implement Vanilla VB84 uh, in the first place. We don't have like single photons, we don't have single photon counters, so we have something else. And because we don't really uh, implement what we are supposed to be implemented, uh, this opens the door to side channel attacks. And the way to kind of uh, prevent these attacks is by developing these kind of strategies. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so what I would like to say uh, very provocatively is that qubits are good for computing, I think, but they are much less good for communicating, at least classical information, which is really what you do with in QKD. You really want to, to exchange classical bits or classical information. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so this was like for the comparison between BB84 and CVQKD. <clears throat> um, now let me give you like a quick state of the art um, of security pros for discrete for um, continuous variable QKD. Um, so okay, so QKD uh, uh, is really like a tomography problem. What you really want to do is you have Alice and Bob, they, they, they share some state. And what you want to be able to do is to kind of uh, characterize the correlations between Alice and Bob and show that if the correlations are good enough, then you can get like a useful upper bound on if information about some row key. Okay, so this is really what you want to do. Uh, if you want to do composable security against general attacks, uh, the thing that you want to compute for your state is this kind of smooth mean entropy uh, of x1 up to xn, uh, condition on ifs, side uh, information. And this is computed for the, the old bipartite state uh, corresponding to the end uses of the channel. So this quantity is very hard to compute in general, uh, but for a lot of nice protocols, uh, you can show that you can, instead of computing this, you can show that it's very close to n times something which is much simpler to compute, which is this uh, conditional von Neumann entropy computed for a single use uh, of the channel. Uh, and here we can already see like a difficulty for CVQKD. So uh, if you want to compute this quantity for BB84 or like for discrete variable protocols, uh, this state rho A, X, E, or rho B, A, B, E, uh, will be like a four qubit pure state for BB84. So you have like 16 parameters. So you can compute everything like uh, and rather easily, you can optimize uh, things. Uh, but if you're dealing with CV QKD, uh, then your state is an, it's not a two qubit or four qubit state anymore. It's like a four mode state. Uh, so it lives in this huge Hilbert space, which is spanned by this uh, get i, j, k, l, where i, j, k, l, they are both uh, integers. So it's an infinite dimensional space. 
And even if you truncate the Fox space, you say, okay, I don't, I forget. I don't care about states with more like than, with more than 10 photons per mode. Uh, even doing that, you get something which is like 10 to the four parameters, which is uh, huge. <coughs> um, and I think kind of the one or the only useful tool that we have uh, to kind of say something about von Neumann entropies uh, in the CV regime uh, uh, is the fact that uh, the von Neumann entropy is maximized by Gaussian state. So if you have a state rho, uh, its von Neumann entropy will be upper bounded by the, the von Neumann entropy computed for rho g, where rho g is the state, the Gaussian state with the same covariance matrix as rho. Okay, and the covariance matrix uh, for like a four mode uh, uh, state, it will be like a eight by eight um, matrix. It will have like uh, a few tens of, uh, of parameters. Um, so there's a QKD version of this, uh, this claim, which is uh, that the, 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 um, the Olivo information between some rho key and if is upper bounded by the Olivo information between the Rocky and Eve computed for the Gaussian state with the same covariance matrix as our state. So this was noticed like 15 years ago and this led uh, a few pa in these papers, uh, people managed to use this to, to prove the asymptotic security of CVQKD against collective attacks. Okay. For protocols with the Gaussian modulation. So for protocols where alpha, the states which are uh, sent by Alice, this alpha is chosen from a Gaussian um, distribution. Okay, so this was basically what we had like for a long time. Uh, and in the last few years, uh, there was some progress. So uh, I want really to talk about two kinds of protocols, the protocols with a Gaussian modulation and the protocol with a discrete modulation. Uh, so for the protocols with a Gaussian modulation, I think the problem is essentially solved, not completely, but almost. Uh, and the protocol for with discrete modulation, so when alpha is chosen from a discrete set, uh, is still very open. Uh, and it's somewhat a pressing issue because people really want to implement this thing. Uh, and we are missing and like uh, even the most basic security proofs. Um, okay, so first, uh, the protocols with the Gaussian modulation. So alpha is chosen from this uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. So there we have kind of two techniques. Uh, that allow us to, to prove security against general attacks. Um, so there's, there was a first uh, technique uh, which was which uses the, the entropic uncertainty relation. Uh, here the idea is that you you don't quite do this heterodyne measurement that I was mentioning, but you really measure uh, as a quadrature, so x or p. So you measure either the, the real part of the of this beta or the or the imaginary part. You choose one of those. So you discretize the your results, and then you can you can you can prove uh, uh, an entropic uncertainty relation like this. So you can show that the smooth mean entropy of x given e, which is exactly what you want to to bound, plus uh, the max entropy, the smooth max entropy of the other quadrature measurement given b, now given above, is lower bounded by something, which is explicit. So we have an explicit uh, formula here. And this max entropy, you can evaluate it um, uh, in the protocol. So you, this way you can get, get a, a lower bound on this mean entropy. So this is very nice, uh, but there are kind of two drawbacks. So the protocol here, it requires so-called squeeze states. So it cannot work with square on states, the, one, uh, the ones I was mentioning before that are really easy to, to prepare and practice. And the bound that we get here is not believed to be tight. But still, uh, we get uh, like a full security proof, proof uh, in that setting. Um, a different approach to, to proof security. So it's using kind of definity type arguments. Uh, and in particular, I'm kind of a Gaussian version of the definity theorem. So here, the crucial part, the crucial fact is that the, the protocol that I was uh, describing before is symmetric with respect to the unitary group. Un, uh, and this group is much much bigger than the the permutation group Sn that we that we have for BB84. So because of that, because the, the protocol is symmetric uh, with respect to a much bigger group, symmetric group, 
uh, we can constrain uh, we can constrain the the, the 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 states that we need to look at uh, a lot more. So we don't just need to look at IID states uh, as in the usual definity theorem, but here we can even restrict uh, the analysis to Gaussian IID states. Uh, and then when you do that, then you can can prove the security uh, of the protocol. Um, Using equivalent property and uh, uh, and some uh, kind of standard tricks. The only missing element here in this in this, in this line of work is that uh, uh, this assumes that uh, the, the measurements they are infinitely precise, which is not the case in practice. In practice, the, the detectors they will have like a, like just a finite precision, a few bits of precision. So this kind of uh, this precision issue is not uh, is not included in the security proof. So the security proof is not quite complete at the moment. Um, okay, so this is for like Gaussian modulation, but really what we want to do in practice is not that. Uh, uh, what people want to do is to use a discrete modulation. So this is your, if you, this is your complex plane, your phase space. What you really want to do is to not to send states uh, with a Gaussian distribution, uh, but rather states from a small constellation of points, say four points like these ones. Uh, so there have been a lot of pe people working on this and uh, there are different motivations for this. Uh, first, it's much easier to implement. Uh, so this is really what the telecom industry they are trying to do, they are doing. Uh, it's also better for error correction. It's easier to do error correction with this kind of uh, modulation schemes and with uh, Gaussian modulation. Uh, and there's a huge interest from the industry to do that. And in Europe, we have this uh, a flagship project uh, where we study exactly this, uh, this kind of protocols. Uh, so it's nice, so this is really what we want to do, but the, the theory is even more complicated now. Uh, the entropic uncertainty relation, it don't help at all um, because here we have coherent states and uh, these, uh, these relations only apply with squeeze state uh, at the moment. Uh, of course, when you do this kind of discrete modulation, you lose the, the nice uh, symmetries of the Gaussian distribution. So the, the, the symmetry with respect to the unitary group uh, is now broken. So you cannot use the Gaussian definity anymore. So it's an, and it's also unclear how to perform a uh, parameter estimation in that setting. Uh, and even if you look at, uh, if you look at now the, the, the entanglement based protocol corresponding to, to this one, uh, it's not ni as nice as before. It's not, uh, you don't start with the Gaussian bipartite state uh, as before. You don't do like Gaussian measurement for Alice. Uh, so you kind of break all the symmetry that you had and even bonding the von Neumann entropy is not so, so easy to do. Uh, so there was a recent paper that, uh, that kind of dealt uh, uh, with a case uh, where you have only two states in your constellation. Uh, it's a paper by uh, Matsura et al. Uh, and the way they do it is by kind of mapping the protocol to a qubit protocol. Uh, say that you have two states and they're basically uh, combinations of zeros and ones in a, some qubit space. Uh, that's nice, but we kind of know that uh, using only two states in the constellation is not enough to get good performance. Uh, it's kind of unclear at the moment how to extend uh, this result to like four states in the constellation or, or more. Um, but so last year, there were like uh, two kind of advances, two papers uh, in PRX that kind of uh, made progress on this question. Um, so one by Shulik uh, Gorai, Philippe Grangier, Lenny Dionti, and myself. Uh, and one by uh, Lin, um, I forgot the first name of uh, Upadhyaya, and, and Norbert Ricaeus. Uh, and both, both papers, they kind of uh, do the same thing. They, so they look at, so the setting that we look at is asymptotic security for collective attacks. So you assume that the channel parameters, they are, they are known. You don't care about financial effects. Uh, so you assume that you know, uh, say your covariance matrix, and you just want to bound uh, either the Olivo information or the conditional volume entropy. And the way you do that is you reduce the problem to a convex optimization problem. Uh, of that form, basically we minimize some function of the state subject to some uh, uh, constraints. Uh, so rho has to be uh, like a, a state, uh, positive semi-definite with trace one. Uh, and then you have a lot of constraints, which are the constraints that you get by observing the, 
the data in the prepare and measure protocol. Uh, and the difference between the, the two, these two papers. So in, in our paper, we were looking for a functional here, F, which is very kind of nice, which is linear in, in rho, uh, which is basically an element of the covariance matrix uh, between Alice and Bob. This is what we wanted to bound. And then we use this Gaussian optimality I was mentioning before. Uh, and when you do that, you have a simple uh, SDP optimization, uh, which can in principle be extended to larger modulation, more than four states. Uh, the problem is that the bounds that we get, they are not tight. Um, and in the paper by Lin, Upadhyaya, and Luke Kanaos, they, they directly bound the, the right quantity. So they directly bound the, the conditional von Neumann entropy, H of X given E. Uh, so what is nice is that it gives you them a much tighter key rate. Uh, but the, the kind of the, the bad thing is that the, the objective function now is nonlinear uh, in a row. So the optimization is more involved than with our techniques. Uh, but if you compare this, uh, these two, the results of these two papers, so this is a plot from uh, Lin et al. So the kind of the blue line is a secret key rate that you would get as a function of distance. If you had a Gaussian modulation, uh, and this green line is what uh, the second paper gets uh, for this four state uh, modulation. So it's not quite as good as the Gaussian modulation, but it's quite nice. I mean, it goes to like uh, more than 180 kilometers. And this red, uh, this red uh, line is what we get. So clearly uh, our, our approach is less tight. Uh, than this one for four states. Uh, so this was last year. So this is, uh, these are both uh, are nice results. So, but there are quite, there are a few limitations to these works. Uh, first, these are only numerical results. Uh, so that's quite disappointing, but um, that's the way it is. Uh, maybe a more like a, uh, Problematic uh, issue is that the, the, the true SDP, these this, uh, this optimization problems, they cannot be directly solved because they have like infinite dimension. So what you need to do in both these problems is to, to truncate uh, the, the Fox space to like uh, say 10, 10 or 15 uh, photons per mode. Uh, so this seems okay. I mean, numerically it seems like that you have something which is uh, converging nicely. So it, Seems okay, it seems fine to do that, but there's no proof. Uh, but there's a poster uh, about this, uh, making some improvements about this uh, at QCrypt, so poster 92. Uh, another limitation of these two works is that they only deal with ideal detection uh, and not with like realistic detections where you have like uh, uh, imperfect um, um, detection with noise and a bit of loss. Uh, so I think it's rather easy to patch uh, this approach to, the, to take uh, imperfections into account, uh, but it still won't be tight. You won't, st you still won't be uh, like uh, get a tight bound. Uh, I think it's harder for uh, adapting uh, this kind of approach to um, the second approach to uh, imperfections in the detection. But uh, there's also a poster by Lin et al. Uh, presented at this edition of QCrypt. Uh, in both this work, this works parameter estimation is completely ignored. Uh, so we don't know how to deal with that at the moment. And it's not clear what will happen with larger constellations. So uh, what I guess is that uh, uh, our approach will extend more nicely to, to larger constellations. It will be because the TSDP is easier to solve. And I think it will get tighter and tighter as you increase the size of the, of the constellation but this remains to, to be done. Okay, so yeah, so this is a good, pretty much the- Anthony, you're, yeah. you have about uh, just a few minutes left. It's already- Okay, uh, fine, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, so thanks Fred. So this is what I wanted to say about the state of the art of security proofs for CVQKD. <clears throat> and in the last few minutes, I just want to, to mention a few open questions. Uh, what are the next steps? Um, <clears throat> so, so first kind of thing that we want to do is to get security against general attacks. Uh, we want to have like a finite size analysis. So kind of a, a nice technique that has emerged in the last few years that is 
turned out to be very useful for discrete variable QKD, also for device independent QKD. Uh, is the entropy accumulation theorem. Uh, it was developed by Frederick Dupuis, Omar Fauzi, and Renato Renner. Uh, and basically, th this technique, it, it allows you to kind of lower bound the, the smooth spin entropy that you want um, by n times some quantity that is computed for a single use of the channel. So for discrete variable QKD or for device independent QKD, this is this is what you want because then a single use of the channel is kind of easy to, to, to characterize and to analyze. Um, for continuous variable QKD, it's more tricky than that um, because even that we don't really know what to do. Um, so there are several difficulties to adapt this uh, entropy accumulation theorem to continuous variables. And kind of the one difficulty is that this it, it requires some test. You kind of require that uh, you want to check that the corrections are good enough. Uh, so for discrete variables, it's kind of easy to, to come up with the, the right test. You want to check that Alice and Bob, they get the, the right, the same bit when they measure on the same basis, or you want to, to check that they violate CHSH inequality uh, as they should. Uh, for continuous variables, it's more tricky because, uh, because some of these tests should be related to the covariance matrix of the state, but it's not clear how to do that. And also the test should depend on some unbounded continuous outcome. And again, this is this makes things much more complicated. So at the moment, we don't really know how to kind of adapt this test uh, for it to continuous variables. So it's a big open question how to do that. I think the real difficulty here, so we'll just mention it quickly. So it's really these unbounded variables that we get. Uh, so you can just think about this classical set problem, which looks very simple, but it turns out to be not so simple. So you're given n, uh, n instances of some IID random variable. Uh, you promise that the random variable has zero mean, and you just want to estimate the, the, the variance of this thing. And this is basically what we want to do in CVQKD, and it's not so easy to do, because if you do random sampling, as we do in discrete variable, QKD, this won't work. Uh, you can always kind of, kind of cook up uh, expressions, I mean, distributions like this, where you get zeros most of the time, and just sometimes you get a very large amplitude, very large xi. Uh, and if you don't uh, sample essentially all, uh, all, the, all your string, you won't, you won't see that. You won't see these events that, that, uh, that are very important to, to estimate the, the, the variance. So there's a solution that has been used in the past for CVQKD is to apply a random rotation to your vector. So if you get a vector x1 to xn, what you can do is you apply your random orthogonal rotation or orthogonal uh, transformation to your vector. You get a new vector, and then you, you just measure the few, cord few first coordinates. And then because this state, this, this vector will have like this rotation symmetry, uh, you can use concentration of measure and it will give you a uh, tight bounds on the variance. So this was used to to deal with protocols with Gaussian modulation, but this cannot be used for protocol with a discrete modulation. So at the moment, we don't know how to perform parameter estimation uh, for protocol with a discrete modulation. Uh, and one important open question that also remains uh, more concretely is what is the optimal constellation? How many states should we use? So it's kind of clear that we won't use in practice a Gaussian modulation because it's not physical, so we need a finite constellation. We know that if you do two or three states, uh, it's not enough to get a good performance. So four states, they are okay. Uh, and we have like uh, some kind of uh, asymptotic results. These were the two papers I was mentioning, I was mentioning before. Um, but if we increase the number of states, we should expect uh, the key rate to, to kind of reach the one of the Gaussian modulation. So we can expect a 10 uh, fold increase in the key rate if we use more than four states. Uh, moreover, if you use more than four states, it will be much better for parameter estimation and for finance effects. Uh, and this is very easy to do for the telecom industry. They kind of use these kind of modulation schemes uh, uh, in practice. Um, so yeah, so one thing to be done is really to try to extend the previous results to see uh, what is the impact of an increased uh, constellation size on the, uh, on the key rate. Okay, so now I'm reaching my conclusion. So I just want to say a few words to, to conclude and give uh, some open questions. So in my view, I mean, I think that continuous variable QKD is really well suited to, to large scale deployment of QKD. Um, 
it's really compatible with telecom industry standards. It's really what uh, like the big uh, telecom operators they want to do. They want to 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 use coherent states. They want to use coherent detection. They really don't want, I think, to use single photon uh, single photons and to use uh, photon counters to to measure the states. Uh, but the security is quite involved. Uh, there are lots of uh, new things that appear. So infinite, dim infinite dimension and bounded variables, uh, discretization, truncation. But I would kind of argue that it's probably not more involved than for modern discrete variable QKD protocols, like twin field or device, uh, measurement device independent protocols or protocols with decoy states. I mean, all these protocols, they have so many features that uh, getting a full security proof is probably not so easy. Uh, in contrast, the, the CVQKD, you, you don't have all these kind of strange additions or features. You have the basic protocol and that's it. So, but, but the basic protocol and the rules of the protocol, they change a little bit. You have these unbounded variables that you have to deal with. Uh, so I think that the, the problems, it's not easy, but you have kind of clean problems, clean mathematical problems that you can play with. Um, I just want to conclude with kind of some changes for the theorists. So is it possible to, to apply entropy accumulation to CVQKD? Uh, or should we perform a parameter estimation if you don't have this kind of rotation symmetry? So if you have a discrete modulation and kind of this important open question that, uh, that should be resolved soon uh, is what is the best constellation that you should use? So do you want four states or do you want to use a large constellation? Okay, and with that, I would like to thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Anthony, for this very nice talk. I guess I'll uh, applaud uh, on behalf of the whole audience. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time for questions. We're already over uh, over the the slot. Uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll just uh, we we had a few uh, comments from uh, Chiang Zhang, so uh, maybe I can uh, open his mic just a second. Maybe it's easier if we can actually talk directly. Uh, Chiang, uh, you should be uh, allowed to talk now. Oh, okay. So uh, first, I, I would like to thank the speaker. I think it's a very good theory. But uh, about, uh, I only want to comment uh, about about the, the comparison between DV and CV about the implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's not true because uh, I have two basically two main comments. The first one is uh, for the current uh, DV QKD. I mean, even for for the for the product. All for the you know the the experimental setup, we do not need any single photon source or photon number resolving detector. That's really actually not necessary. Mm -hmm. There is a very good solution and a commercialized solution for that. Uh, so it shouldn't be the disadvantage for the for D way. Uh, and the second one is uh, the for the DI MDI or TFQKD is basically for implementation security. It's not only Applied for the DV QKD, but also for CV QKD, and also for you know the also for the, for good for the cri uh, classical crypto system. You you need you need to think about that. Impl it's the implementation security. It, it's not because the DV QKD is not good enough. So we need the uh, such kind of protocol. That, that's my two uh, comment. And and my feeling is like uh, DV QKD and CV QKD both had an uh, advantage and disadvantage. For me, I think DV QKD may have problem is its price. Probably it's a little bit higher than CV QKD, but it, it's good for long distance communication. And CV probably cheaper. And it, here, I understand you didn't talk about that because you probably doesn't know very well about that because uh, I understand because you're a theorist, but uh, it's really unfair b b because of your, your, comp your comparison is kind of, you know, it's not related to current technology, as you see. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I was trying to be a bit provocative. So I agree that uh, I, I, I should have like that. a more measured... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I do. Yes, yes. Thank you. I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know if there are any other questions here. Um, otherwise, maybe I have a I have a question. Um, so uh, early in the talk, you uh, you said something about CVQKD being much less robust to noise than the than the less, yeah. QKD. Um, can Can you elaborate a bit on that? It seems like it does seem a bit artificial in the sense that uh, maybe it's, I guess it's because it's noisier somehow and uh, that, 
that's expensive during error correction. Is that it, or am I completely? So yeah, so so what I said is that the, the, the protocols are less robust to losses. Uh, oh, to, yeah, to loss. Sorry. Yeah, so it's kind of the if you look at the. But I guess if you if you have loss, I guess in CV it the, it translates into very uh, low valued signals somehow. Exactly. Yes. Right. But, so but the but the key right doesn't doesn't yeah exactly. But um, so what you will typically so. If you have like asymptotic regime, so if you don't care about finance as effects and you assume that you know the, this excess noise, these kind of channel parameters yeah. very well, uh, infinitely precisely, you get this kind of nice curves. So you can mm -hmm. go to 200 kilometers without any problem. But uh, as soon as you look at finance as effects, you need to kind of estimate uh, uh, this excess noise value very precisely. And then you, you will usually see like a huge drop of the key rate like at 100 kilometers or so if you have like block size, which is 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11. So if you really want to go to much longer distances, you need huge block sizes because you need to estimate your, your noise very precisely. Um, that's okay. Kind of and this is, this is somehow fundamental or is it? Or should it be in your other box of a more challenging theory somehow? It seems like it's something that you could you could somehow deal with, right? Because you have the information compared to the discrete variable. Yeah, like I you. agree. So it's not, yeah, I would say it's fundamental, but I don't have a proof for that. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think no. I mean, I mean, in practice, it will always be easier to go to long distances with discrete variables and with continuous variables. Maybe there are some tricks that can be invented for. CV to, to extend the range. So, but the, the kind of the only trick that you have is to, to extend the block size to use very long, uh, very large blocks, say 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, and then you can get to longer distances. But the problem is that you have so much, uh, the, the kind of the noise that is introduced by the, the adversary is so small compared to the, to the shot noise, to the noise due to the entropic uncertainty and to the uncertainty relation. You have to, to measure this kind of very small additional noise due to the adversary. And among like, yeah, and doing this requires a lot of samples. Um, so you need, yeah, to do parameter estimation with very large block size. Right, thanks. So we have a few more questions that appeared, but I think we're completely out of time here because the next session is gonna start in 15 minutes already. We want to have a break. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm gonna thank you, Anthony again for his, for his very nice uh, talk. And uh, for the next 15 minutes, we're gonna have a break in the, uh, the meet and greet uh, rainbow room. And Should I start now?
So hi, everyone. Welcome to the first contributed talk session of QCrypt uh, 2020. Um, so the format that we're going to follow for um, uh, this session and for similar sessions is that we're going to have a series of speakers giving five minute talks back to back. And then after that, there will be a Q&A session for all the talks. Um, so uh, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A, um, uh, which I think people can see on the uh, lower bar of their screen um, or upper bar. And uh, if you enter a question in the Q&A, it would be good if you can say specifically who it's for, um, just because since we have multiple talks, say who the question is for. And then after the talks are over, we'll have some time to discuss those. So for our first talk, um, we have uh, Jia Yu Zhang from Boston University, who is going to speak about succinct blind quantum computation using a random oracle. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to share my recent result on succinct blind quantum computation using a random oracle. I'm Jia Yu Zhang from Boston University. So what is blind quantum computation? In this problem, Alice has a quantum circuit C and it wants to evaluate it and get C0. But it doesn't have the ability to apply C itself. So it makes use of a remote quantum server. But on the other hand, it has a trust server and want to keep C secret. So it wants to design a protocol to interact with the server and get the result. This is a fundamental. On the one hand, the problem itself is very important because with high probability in the near future, quantum computers can only be used as a cloud service. So if we want to make use of its power and simultaneously want to keep our data or circuit secure, such a protocol is needed. What's more, this problem has become the test bed for new techniques that can be often applied to related problems like quantum computer verification. Let's give a review of existing works. Existing works can be mainly classified into two classes. One class is IT secure protocols, and the representative is a ubiquitous protocol by Robert Fisman Cartography. One burden of this protocol is the size of quantum, quantum gadgets that need to be prepared by the client is linear, linear to the size of the circuit. And this seems to be inherent for all the, all the known IT secure protocols. Another class of protocols are protocols based on trapped assumptions. Recently, Mahati built a protocol based on the language error assumption, where the client can be completely classical. And let's focus on assumptions. In cryptography, there are many two kinds of, two kinds of assumptions. One is a public key assumption, another is symmetry key assumption. So in this paper, we ask the following question. What if we only have symmetric cryptographic primitives? And we also have a specific goal, which is to make it better than the existing IT secure protocols. We want the client side quantum computation, our protocol, to be independent to the circuit side C. So if we classify protocols based on client side quantum computation and assumptions, we get the following table. And this table shows some different trade offs in this problem. And we can see in the bottom left corner, this is the BFK protocol. And in the top right corner, this is Mahadev's protocol, which shows two different trade-offs between class and quantum computation and assumptions. And our work is here, which shows the new trade-offs between these two factors. We can see that the pro this problem is a quantum random Merkle model, which, which is the ideal model for symmetric primitives. And in this model, we get a protocol where the class of quantum computation is only a fixed polynomial of the security parameter. In details, our protocol is correct and efficient and it contains two phases. In the first phase, the client prepares and sends some quantum gadget to the server, which only uses polycarpal quantum gates. And in the second phase, both parties do only classical interaction. And our protocol is secure against unbounded adversary that makes substantial number of random oracle curates. And in practice, we can instantiate them by, run, by head functions. The top-down overview of our construction is as follows. First, 
the client will prepare and send some initial gadgets. And each gadget is of the following form. And the gadget is a superstition to long strings given in this paper. And then both parties use some classical interactions to expand the number of gadgets securely in some sense. And finally, both parties can use this gadget to evaluate the circuit security. And this step is called the remote gadget preparation step. It's constructed using the following idea. First, we design weakly secure and gadget increasing protocol. And second, we amplify the security to a fully secure protocol that is also gadget increasing. This is the most difficult part of this work. And the evaluation step is also not trivial, actually. And we can give a summary and give some open questions here. Our work shows it's possible to do universal blank quantum computation in the quantum random oracle model, which is an ideal model for high functions of symmetric encryption, and the class quantum computation is succinct, which is only a fixed polynomial on the security parameter. And we can see there are also many unknown cells in this table. Our understanding for the impossibility in this problem is still quite limited. Even if we already have some negative evidences, we still need some deeper understanding. So some further improvement on this table will be interesting. Thank you. Questions are welcome. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, so um, uh, in, uh, as we said, feel free to enter uh, Q and A's as the talks go along. Our second speaker um, will be Alex Grillo, who will talk about secure multi-party quantum computation with the dishonest majority. All right, okay. Can you see my slides? Can I start? Okay. So this is a joint work with Ifke Dulek, Stacy Jeffrey, Christian Mayans, and Christian Schaffner. And uh, in, in this setting, we, we, have, we have here multiple parties and each party has an input and our goal is to devise a protocol where these parties can jointly compute some quantum circuit on, on these quantum inputs that it, each party has. However, some of these parties, they are honest, but the other ones might be malicious. And our goal is to devise a protocol where the private input of an honest party is not linked to, to the other parties. Also, we want that uh, in our protocol, if these honest parties do not abort, then we, we indeed uh, perform the correct computation phi on the inputs, uh, on the chosen inputs of all the parties. And here in this work, we, 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 we achieve for the first time a protocol where you have multiple parties or so have an arbitrary number of players. And we require, the only requirement there is exists a single honest player. Or in other words, we, we tolerate up to k minus one, one. malicious servers, uh, malicious clients. Um, player, sorry. But in order to achieve this result, we need to add some computational assumptions. So we, we need uh, to, to bound the computational power of these malicious uh, adversaries to be polynomially bounded. And let me now present some of the ingredients of, uh, to, uh, that enable us to achieve this result. So the first one is uh, doing uh, using classical multi-party computation. So in our protocol, we assume that the parties can compute uh, classical functions in a secure and private way. The, the, the second ingredient that we, use, uh, that we use in our protocol is a quantum authentication code. And in particular, we use the Clifford code that I will explain a bit in more detail in the next slide. And combining these two, this, these two main ingredients, we're able to achieve a protocol that uh, allow us to do multi-party quantum computation, where the number of rounds is the number of players k times the c naught and t depth of the quantum circuit that they want to run, and the logarithm of the security parameter needed for the computational assumption. So 
let me get into more details. And uh, our our protocol is is uh, inspired by the this protocol by Dupuy, Niels, and Salvai on two party quantum computation. And as I said, it, it, it's based on the Clifford code. And the Clifford code, in order to encode some quantum state psi, it appends some, uh, some uh, n auxiliary bits started at zero that we call traps. And, uh, then, and then to encode, you apply a, one applies a random Clifford on all of this quantum state. And the good property that you have from the Clifford code is that if someone tampers with this encoded state, then one of these traps will turn up into one with overwhelming probability. So, so one uh, the, the person who has access to this random Clifford key could check this with overwhelming probability. Then in this two-party uh, protocol by DNS, they, they use this idea to perform a, a two-layer encoding. So the idea is that the first player appends her own trap uh, register and then applies a random Clifford. And on this first encoding, the second player appends a second uh, red, uh, trap register and applies also a second random Clifford key. In order to check the authentication to, or the integrity of a, an encoding, then what they do is to, to use classical multiparty computation to switch the, the, the roles between outer and inner parties, so, so the ones who, who hold the inner and outer keys. And it's not hard to see that the one who has an outer key could just check uh, her private uh, trap register and check if the and check the integrity of, of, of this encoded state. In our result, we, we uh, in order to avoid uh, having uh, each party having uh, their own trap register, we do it in a different way. So we just have one set of traps and one random Clifford key, but this random Clifford key is not known by any, uh, so it's not fully known by any party, but is distributed among them. And the main technical contribution is that we can use this distributed, uh, this, uh, distributed random Clifford key in order to do a public authentication test that will enable any of the parties to check the integrity of this, uh, of, an, uh, of uh, an encoded state. So just to summarize, so we're able to have a, a protocol for multi-party quantum computation. And we're the first uh, protocol that uh, achieves uh, security against k minus one out of k dishonest players. And we do it by, by lifting the, the, the properties of these par protocols for two-party quantum computation to multi-party by, by, uh, by changing their private verification uh, sub-protocol to a public verification one. And I'd like to thank you for attention. Great, thank you. Um, can we have the next uh, set of slides? Okay, so for our third talk today, we have uh, Shihan Hong, who is going to talk about non-interactive classical verification of quantum computation. Shihan, I think you're muted. Oh, should I start? So should I start again or? Yes, start over there. Okay, sure. Um, hi everyone. So thanks for giving me the chance to speak in QCRIT. So this is a joint work with uh, Gorian Elkic, Andrew Childs and Alex Grillo about uh, non-interactive verification of quantum computation. So first of all, we formalize a problem of verification of quantum computation as uh, giving interactive arguments for BQP languages. So in this talk, uh, the questions that we, 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 we are trying to answer is, is the following. So the first is that can quantum computation be certified with a single message? up to um, some preprocessing step that is independent of the instance. 
And second, uh, can certified quantum computation be performed in zero knowledge? So, um, so we answered these questions by upgrading the MARDEV protocol in the following steps. So first we show that uh, the key generation in the first message can be done uh, before the verification starts independent of the instance. And then we show that uh, the, the constant sound is error can be improved by applying parallel repetition. So in particular, we, sh we show a parallel repetition theorem in which the soundness error decays exponentially at its optimal rate. And the next step is to apply the run reduction technique called Kirchner to uh, reduce the run capacity down to a single message. And finally, uh, I will also uh, show you that uh, uh, how we compile the protocol into a classical non-interactive zero knowledge for BQP or QMA. So the first step is the is an instance independent setup. So the idea is simple. Um, before uh, in the setup phase, the, the key generation is done according to like you, you first sample a random basis, and then you sample the keys according to random basis. And after the verification starts, the, the verifier samples a local term from the local Hamiltonian, and then uh, only checks if the random basis matches the local term. Uh, if they don't match, uh, the verifier accepts. So this step um, decreases the uh, company's soundness gap by a constant factor, but it can be compensated by applying a stage of uh, hardness amplification to, uh, to remove that. So the second step is um, uh, the technically challenge parts in our work, which is a parallel repetition theorem for the verification protocol. So in particular, we show that uh, sound is error of a K-copy protocol is negligibly close to, to, to the negative K. So uh, we do this by first characterizing the, the behavior of the prover and the verifier as a projection that depends on the, the charge coins. So in a K4 protocol, there are uh, two to a K possible challenge, uh, challenges. So this gives a mathematical handle on this problem. And the next step is to show that uh, the projectors are nearly orthogonal to each other uh, with respect to any quantum states that the prover, the prover can prepare. Otherwise, uh, we construct an attack to the MADA protocol. So by the soundness guarantee of the, the, the verification protocol, uh, we conclude that these project projectors are nearly orthogonal to each other. So uh, because uh, these projectors are nearly orthogonal uh, with respect to any quantum states, the prover can prepare. Um, any prover can win as most a single charge out of the two to the K possibilities meaning that the soundness error is at most uh, too negligibly close to two to the K. So the th third step is to apply uh, Fischer-Mir to turn the three message public coin protocol into a non-interactive protocol. This is done in a quantum random oracle model. And the loss is quadratic in the number of queries to the random oracle. In that it won't work if we don't apply parallel repetition before uh, applying fusion mirror transformation. So the reduction is basically the same as uh, the reduction presented in, in the paper by uh, Don, Claire, Mayans, and Schaffner. So in the last step, uh, we also present a classical non-interactive zero knowledge for BQP or QMA. So uh, we, we proceed by explaining why the protocol is not zero knowledge. The reason is that part of the interaction cannot be simulated. So in a, in a set, uh, to show that the protocol is zero knowledge, you need to present a 
simulator who can simulate the interaction between the approver and verifier. So uh, our approach is to view this, the witness in dependent messages, uh, so witness to some MP relation. Instead of sending a witness in the plain text, the prover sends a music proof uh, to this MP language. So by the uh, zero knowledge property of the music scheme, um, we show that uh, the, the protocol is zero knowledge. So yeah, so that's a brief overview of uh, our work. So thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Omar for the Q and A. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me first read the question from uh, Thomas Vidic, which was about garble gates. Uh, can you give more intuition about gar garble gates? And this was for Jiao. Jiao. You already answered, but uh, can you maybe say it more explicitly? Answer. Okay, so yes, so what Professor Vidic is was saying is basically correct. Uh, in this paper, the, the discussion of Goblin is, is different from what Goblin is really used in other other problems. We don't need to really cover a large circuit. What we need is to use coupling as a encapsulation of some. What we need is to cover some small circuit. And this circuit will allow us to do something that we need, which is to expand the number of gadgets and to protect the security to some level. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have another question for Shinha, also by uh, Toma Vidik. So let me read it. Can you say something about any concrete obstacles to adapting the classical work on correlation and tractable hash functions to instantiate the random oracle in your protocol? Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, this is a great question. So um, I think the instantiation uh, by um, um, Piker and Xuan is is uh, for um, um, this correlation intractable functions against uh, for uh, I forget the name, but uh, yeah, it basically says that uh, um, for every uh, initial message, there is a unique uh, uh, winning challenge that uh, the prover can choose to win. So the prover, uh, given the first commitment, the prover can win uh, at most a single challenge. So there is a, there is a, a, a one to one correspondence between them. So uh, yeah, so we don't know how to instantiate using the same uh, construction by Piker and Shihan. But uh, the main reason is that uh, uh, um, the first message uh, present uh, by the sending sent by the prover um, does not really correspond to the input to this function. Um, so, so which means that uh, 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 the setting is different. The yeah. So, um, yeah, I would say that I, I thought about that, but uh, there are some obstacles that I still cannot overcome. Yes. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Um, perhaps I ask a question to Alex. Uh, can you comment on the on the optimality of the dependence in communication? In general, on the, on the dependence on communication of your protocol. So actually, yeah, uh, this is not optimal. I think one uh, actually the round of communication is not optimal. You could try to reduce it by by sending larger messages, for instance. So we discussed a little about this, but we prefer to have a more modular way where you don't have to send a lot of qubits at the same time. So this is some kind of uh, trade-off between communications per round and round of communication. Okay. 
Any other questions? Okay, if no more questions, then uh, let's go to the coffee break right now and we reconvene in about half an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers. Yes, yeah, so the next session will start at 1630 Amsterdam time. So hi, everyone. Um, uh, welcome back. This will be the second group of contributed talks in the conference. Um, so this time uh, we're going to have um, four talks back to back and then the Q&A afterwards uh, as before. So for the first talk, uh, we will have Gorian Alagic speaking about impossibility of quantum virtual black box obfuscation of classical circuits. Okay, thanks. Can, can you guys see the slides and hear me? Okay, great. So, uh, whoops. So this is joint work with uh, Zvika, Ifka, and Chris. And we showed that it's not possible to use quantum mechanics to obfuscate classical programs uh, in this black box manner. So I'll be using Ifka's very nice slides. So first, what's obfuscation? So it's just some method for turning a useful program into a functionally equally useful program, which is somehow unreadable in terms of code. And this output program doesn't necessarily have to be a program itself. It could potentially be something, some object that you can evaluate the original function with, like let's say a quantum state. Um, and we're interested in kind of cryptographic strength obfuscation, which demands three properties. The first one is that efficiency is preserved. Uh, the second is that functionality is preserved. And the third is the obfuscation property, which says roughly that anything that you can learn um, using uh, by studying the obfuscated circuit kind of as input, you can also learn just by plugging stuff in and seeing what comes out. So as an oracle. So in our case, the obfuscated object will be a quantum state. So we'll also need some public algorithm which tells us how to use this state to evaluate the program. So I just want to emphasize, you know, that the comparison we're making here is between two very different things. You know, on the left-hand side, the adversary is really able to, you know, get the obfuscated circuit as input, you know, study it, take it apart, do all sorts of interesting things with it. And in the other case, the simulator is only able to kind of ask it questions. So, you know, an obfuscator that kind of makes these two things equivalent uh, is a pretty strong kind of uh, object. Okay. So it's been known for some time that uh, classically obfuscation is impossible. And the counterexample circuit family looks something like this. It's, it's a certain point function combined with an encryption of the special input on which the point function does something interesting. And then a checker circuit, which tells you whether you're holding an encryption of the special output, right? So there's that family. And now, um, Technically, the task is to distinguish this kind of family from a family where the point function is just zero everywhere. Right? So it's pretty easy to tell with, a, with only Oracle access that you can't distinguish these two families. Um, however, with a circuit, you can. Um, and the easiest way to see this, um, nowadays at least, not, not when the proof, when this paper was originally written, is using homomorphic encryption. Okay? So the first step is to simply uh, extract this encryption of the special input then to homomorphically evaluate the circuit on that, that gives you an encryption of the special output. And now you can use this third component, this checker part to see that you do indeed have an interesting, you know, you have a point function and not a zero function. Okay, so this is the classical impossibility uh, counter example. So now what about the case of quantum states, which is what we look at. So there's a couple of problems. So we're going to use kind of the same idea for the counter example family, but there's sort of two obstacles, one maybe not so difficult and the other one a little more challenging. One is how to do this homo homomorphic evaluation given that what we have is a quantum state and not a circuit. And the other problem is the reusability problem. So in this, you know, in the previous example, we had to use this circuit three times uh, to perform various tasks. And it could be that uh, the obfuscator that produces quantum states, you know, the, the, its output just sort of blows up after you use it once due to measurement, let's say. 
So the first um, ingredient is relatively easy to get around just using the, the new uh, quantum FHE ingredient that we now have. And the second one requires a little bit of a trick. The trick is basically to turn two of these three parts into classical information so that we can extract them from the obfuscated state without damaging it. And then to leave kind of the third part um, for last. And if at that point the state blows up, that's okay, because we're done. So how does that work in a little bit of detail? So this part already, uh, this encryption of the special input, that's already classical. Um, so this, this third part, this checker circuit, it turns out we can also make classical. And the way we do that is by using um, a classical obfuscation program, uh, or sorry, a classical obfuscator, which works for this very limited class of circuits. Okay, so this is based on um, a certain version of LWE. Okay, so once we've done that, we now have kind of two classical pieces to the obfuscation, both of which we can extract uh, and then revert to the original state. So that's what we do. And now the third step is the one that, you know, may destroy the state, but that's okay. And that's the uh, quantum FHE execution of this point function. Okay. And now finally we can run this classical checker, which we have in our hands. So just comparing to previous results, um, certainly we achieved kind of more in terms of impossibility. However, we also needed to tack on some additional assumptions and it would be nice to see if we can relax those a little bit. Uh, so I won't say much about this secure software leasing paper. It's uh, another work which was done in parallel. They, they prove some additional things like impossibility of copy protection and in addition, this, this result that I'm talking about. And uh, maybe I'll just end with um, two things that would be interesting to look at in future work. One, I guess I already brought up, which is relaxing some of these assumptions. And the other is looking at uh, possibility. And here a natural thing to look at is indistinguishability obfuscation which is a weaker form, but is perhaps possible. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so for people who might've joined recently, um, I'll just refresh on how we're handling Q&A. Um, so basically there's a Q&A feature within Zoom. So if you have a question for any of the speakers, you can type your question there and um, be sure to say who it's for, just so we know which of the speakers. And then after all four talks are over, then we're going to have a discussion about those questions. Okay, so um, for the uh, uh, second talk of this session, we have um, Amri uh, Shmuley, who is going to be discussing scalable pseudo-random quantum states. Thank you, Carl. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay. Can you see the uh, slide? Okay, perfect. So uh, welcome everyone to this talk on scalable pseudo-random quantum states. Uh, my name is Omrish Mueli, and this is a joint work with uh, Tzvika Brakelsky. So in this work, uh, we focus on the efficient generation of quantum random states. And it is a basic fact in quantum information theory that efficiently generating a truly random quantum state is impossible. And this follows by basic uh, counting argument. And because if we think of the space of all n qubit quantum state. This is an infinite space, but even if we discretize it uh, for any negligible precision, the number of points is going to be too big. And we cannot hope to efficiently sample from this uh, distribution. So one solution is to look for a more, a more modest uh, goal that uh, asks that uh, we are going to find an efficiently assemblable distribution such that for a bounded number of copies, uh, this uh, 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 T copies from our sample distribution and T copies from a truly random quantum state are going to be indistinguishable. Uh, for example, we know that for T equals one, this is trivial. A random classical string is uh, indistinguishable, perfectly indistinguishable from uh, one copy of a truly random quantum state. And the, the larger the T, uh, the less and less trivial uh, it becomes to sample and still make it uh, indistinguishable. So there are a few uh, types of uh, approaches that uh, um, implement this solution. And one of them is called a, a pseudo random quantum state generator. So this is a officially separable distribution such that for any polynomial number of copies T, 
a, a, a sampled state from this distribution and a, a truly random quantum state, if we look at t copies of, uh, from each of the distribution, they are going to be computationally indistinguishable, which means indistinguishable for polynomial time quantum circuits. So uh, let's see the definition. Uh, uh, the notion of pseudo random quantum state were first introduced by uh, G, Liu, and Song in uh, Crypto 2018. So this is an efficient quantum algorithm uh, G. Uh, um, it gets a N, a, a size of the quantum state that it outputs, a classical key K. And the definition is exactly as I said, when we think about the, the sampled state uh, for any polynomial number of copies, it is going to be a computationally indistinguishable from the same number of copies of a truly random N qubit quantum state. And these generators are known to exist based on the existence of post-quantum one-way functions. Uh, okay, so one specific property that exists in all PRS, uh, previous PRS generator is that what we think of the security parameter and the number that we think of as the size of the output state, this is exactly the same number. So let's recall for a moment uh, the security definition, the security guarantee of a PRS generator uh, what we're seeing is in blue is the uh, the size of the quantum state, and what we're seeing is red is the security parameter. This is the number that denotes how many copies we're going to let the adversary have, and how hard is it going to be for the adversary to distinguish uh, between the two distribution given the number of copies. And from an operational point of view, this essentially means that the more we want to make our state random, we we need to use more quantum memory. The larger our, our output state of our uh, sample distribution becomes. And the question that we are trying to answer in this work is, can we create a small, highly pseudo-random state? And in more formal terms, can we make a, a PRS generator when it has uh, two independent parameters? Uh, one is the output of the uh, output state, and one, sorry, is the size of the output state. This is N, and lambda is the security parameter. Okay, so this is the definition of a scalable PRS generator. And, okay, yes. And we can see that uh, uh, these uh, two parameters are independent completely. And there is a reason that uh, we, we don't have a security parameter in previous works. And this reason, if we look at the output distribution, the, the support of, of previous PRS generators, then all of the states in the supports are uniform amplitude, uniform superpositions with uh, only the phases are random and the amplitudes are all the same, uniform. And one natural question to ask, well, how does it do, for example, for the smallest number, for the smallest output size, one qubit? And we know that a, a random one qubit state is, covers the entire block sphere and uh, previous uh, PRS non-scalable generators, they only cover this red ring here, which is uh, uh, easy to efficiently distinguish from a truly random one qubit quantum state. And what we want to achieve is instead of randomizing only the phases, we want to randomize only the, also the amplitudes, regardless of the size of the quantum state. And uh, briefly, our results is that uh, uh, we define and explore this notion of scalability, this independence between the size of the output state and the security parameter, how random the state is. Uh, more specifically, uh, we show a framework for uh, constructing such a scalable uh, random quantum objects. And formally, uh, we show uh, the existence of scalable PRS generators, assuming post-quantum one-way functions. Uh, in particular, the same computational assumption uh, for non-scalable PRS generators. And we also uh, show for another notion uh, uh, of uh, uh, efficient generation of quantum state called the uh, T-design, which I didn't uh, uh, define. Uh, we improve the efficiency of existing scalable T-design generators. Existing scalable uh, T-design uh, scalable T generators uh, had depth of a polynomial in N, lambda, and T. And we show a generator with depth polynomial in n lambda and log of t uh, for any polynomial number of copies uh, t n. And thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, the next speaker, go ahead and set up the next set of slides.
Okay, great. So uh, for our next talk, um, we have uh, Andrea Colodangelo, who is going to speak about a quantum money solution to the blockchain scalability problem. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, okay. Cool. So um, in this brief overview, uh, I'll tell you about joint work with Orsatat. And in this work, we show how to combine um, a blockchain with quantum money to achieve a payment system that enjoys uh, the best of both worlds and resolves the so-called scalability problem of blockchains. So what is this problem? Well, um, in a nutshell, oops, in a nutshell, most blockchain designs suffer from the following loosely defined problem, which is that the amount of resources or time required per transaction grows badly with the number of users involved. And so loosely speaking, solving this problem means keeping the amount of resources and time used per transaction approximately constant. So an example of this problem are the long waiting times for transactions confirmations on the Bitcoin blockchain and the limited throughput of transactions, meaning a limited number of transactions that the system can handle per second. And so um, very briefly, let me say a few words about the main ingredients of our payment system. These are blockchains and quantum money. So what is a blockchain? Well, you can think of a blockchain as a sequence of blocks and each block contains information about some previous transactions. And how does a user add a new transaction? Well, let's say that Alice wants to pay four coins to Bob. At a high level, this is how she does it. She will broadcast the transaction, Alice pays four coins to Bob, to the whole network. And this transaction is not immediately added to a block, but it goes to what is known as a pool of pending transactions. And every once in a while, a new block is formed containing transactions from this pool. And this happens via some consensus mechanism that involves the users in the network. And at the end of this, the new block is appended to the old sequence of blocks. And so how should we think of one particular transaction? Well, uh, in its most general form, a transaction allows a user to deposit a number of coins. And these coins can be released and spent according to a set of instructions. These instructions are also specified by whoever is depositing the coins. Okay, and this set of instructions could really be anything that can be specified via code. And such generic transactions are referred to as smart contracts and they're very general. And so payments are just a very special case of a smart contract. And so the pros of a blockchain is certainly that it's decentralized. It requires no bank or trusted third party. Another pro is that it is digital in the sense that unlike physical cash, you don't have to meet in person to exchange it. And the con is that in the absence of a trusted third party, the consensus mechanism is necessary. And this takes time and is usually the bottleneck in terms of efficiency. Now, the other ingredient of our payment system is quantum money, which I won't, I won't describe in, in this brief overview, but um, specifically our payment system relies on a stronger version of public key, public key quantum money, which is called quantum lightning. This was introduced formally by Zandri and informally some years earlier by Lutomirsky and co-authors who called it collision-free quantum money. Now, uh, quantum lightning is just public key quantum money with an added feature, namely that no generation procedure, not even the honest one, should be able to produce two banknotes with the same serial number, except with negligible probability. And in a regular public key quantum money scheme, this is certainly not the case because the bank who creates a banknote can typically create as many copies as it wants of it. And so here are the pros and cons of public key quantum money and quantum lightning. Uh, by definition of security, it cannot be public key quantum money cannot be counterfeited. Uh, another pro is that potentially it could be transferred very quickly, technology permitting via quantum channels or quantum teleportation. And on top of that, it does not require a consensus mechanism. The downside is that it requires a bank, right? A trusted third party who mints the banknotes. And so to recap in quantum lightning scheme, no one can generate two valid banknotes with the same serial number. And this 
is, is, is sort of interesting because it opens to the possibility of removing the trusted third party because we no longer have to trust the bank not to produce many banknotes with the same serial number. And this was a concern before. However, the question that remains is how do you prevent people from creating many quantum banknotes with potentially different serial numbers? This does not violate the security of quantum lightning. So there should be a mechanism to regulate such a generation procedure. And in this work, we provide, we provide precisely this, um, such a mechanism, and this leverages smart contracts on a blockchain. So all in all, um, our payment system combines the classical blockchain and quantum lightning and removes the cons of both. In particular, it requires no trusted third party and payments are still as quick as sending a quantum state from Alice to Bob. And no consensus mechanism is uh, required involving other users other than Alice and Bob. Okay, so this is all that I wanted to say for this brief overview. Thank you. Great, thanks, Andrea. Um, so can we now have the fourth set of slides? Uh, yep, that will be me. Uh, I hope you can see that. Okay, so for the final talk, um, we will have Alessandro Fedrizi, who will speak about experimental quantum conference key agreement. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this talk is why this session was called Mostly Theory. I have to bother you with an experimental talk to end the day. Um, so my name is Alessandro. I'm at Harriet Watt University, and this work was done in my lab uh, under the umbrella of the UK Quantum Communications Hub led by the University of York. Um, Right. Good. So, um, you know, the, the setting that we are in the Zoom call is a perfect uh, background for, for uh, my topic, which is quantum conference key agreement. So we're all in this conference, uh, in this conference call. And most of you know that these things uh, aren't terribly secure, or at least there was a lot of the news of, you know, soon being hacked and all that, right? So quantum conference key agreement moves beyond this two party paradigm and it tries to establish an identical key between uh, any number of users uh, simultaneously. So how does this work? You have a quantum server, it distributes GHZ states uh, to one user called Alice and any number of bobs. So uh, this goes via the quantum channel. And then uh, the measurement protocol um, is very simple. There's a pre-shared sequence um, of rounds, um, which are either Z measurements, so that's zero or one, uh, so all the bobs and, and Alice, uh, they, they all uh, measure either uh, this uh, said um, measurement or an X measurement for parameter estimation. So once they've got these uh, measurements done, they estimate the security parameters uh, and then they go on to the post processing. Um, all the details on, on uh, the security proofs and all that, that you uh, guys would mostly be interested in the mostly theory session uh, in this uh, theory paper from Dagmar Bruce's group. Um, I'm just going to show you quickly how we implement that in the lab. Um, so how do you make a GHZ state? Uh, we've got a TISAF laser at a 320 megahertz clock rate, uh, and we create uh, entangled photons in a down conversion source. So one of these sources seen up uh, at the top here uh, makes an entangled uh, bell state, and then we make a second one, we fuse those together, and in the end we make a four user uh, telecom wavelength uh, GHZ state, and we send it down a bunch of fibers. So we've got four users. The first one's Alice, uh, that's next to the source, uh, effectively. And then there's Bob1, Bob2, Bob3. And we've got a range of different uh, fibers uh, connected to those guys, up to a total of uh, 50 kilometers. Right. Now, um, there's uh, two main results that we've got. Uh, the first one would be the asymptotic uh, key that we can uh, derive from the, the detected raw uh, rates. So uh, here, these data points at the top is the fractional key rate. Uh, the remarkable feature here is that, um, you know, we've got a qubit error rate of around three to four or five percent. Uh, what you see here is that this doesn't depend on the distance almost. So uh, all the qubit error is introduced by the state quality and, and hardly anything gets added by the fiber. 
And this is for us remarkable because it shows that we can send, uh, you know, this is a full apartheid, genuinely entangled full apartheid state, and we can send it over 50 kilometers of fiber, which is, which is quite a distance. The rates down at the bottom, uh, we don't start with very much uh, 30 hertz at the source roughly, and then it goes down uh, to roughly two hertz secure key rate in this asymptotic limit uh, over 12 dB loss. Right, now um, we haven't got uh, that many rounds so we need to do finite key analysis. This was introduced uh, for a conference key agreement in a separate paper by our co-worker Federico Grasselli. Um, and so what you can see here in the dashed line is that's the um, hypothetical upper bound on what we can achieve in, in this uh, finite key um, analysis from the raw keys that we generate for one particular fiber setting. And the red dots are the ones that uh, that's the actual key, secure key that we achieve with full multi-party uh, post-processing. So that's with LDPC, multi-party uh, error correction and privacy amplification. So in the end, we get roughly a megabit of key uh, secure key and uh, we encrypt an image and send that to the users. So that's um, experimental uh, quantum conference key agreement with four users. Um, now the key question is, uh, what is this useful for? Because obviously the rates aren't, uh, you know, very high when you when you send a GHZ uh, state down a bunch of fibers. Now the main advantage uh, is in networks. Um, so, you know, we, we've got roughly around 120 participants in this call. Just imagine you're all uh, on a node of a, of a future quantum network. And let's also assume that the quantum network will provide us with a multi partite entangled resource, which will get refreshed in the background at not a very high rate. Now, uh, you know, if you pick uh, out any uh, number of nodes uh, from this network um, and uh, these users all request uh, simultaneously a conference key, uh, then uh, if you were to do that with pairwise, sort of traditional QKD between, you know, A and B1, A and B2, A and B3, and where then to X or all these keys, then you had to uh, use n, n minus one times uh, this resource. So as you know, you have to throw away the entire resource most in the least efficient way uh, to, to get all these pairwise keys. But uh, in, the, in the best uh, possible case, you can do the, uh, the same thing with just a, a single uh, network use and make uh, directly a GHZ state between all these users. And so a quantum conference key agreement can achieve up to an n uh, minus one uh, time advantage uh, or were just traditional QKD. And that's all I want to say. Uh, look at the longer talk if you want to see more or have a look at the paper in the archive. Um, this was our team, mostly Joseph Ho, who should be hanging around uh, also in, uh, in, in the participant uh, list there, Massimiliano, and of course, Federico Grasselli, our coworker from Düsseldorf, Peter and Mehul Malik, who runs an independent group at Harriet Watt. And that's it, thank you. Great. Thanks to all four speakers uh, from this session. And at this point, I will turn it over to Omar. Thanks also for, to the speakers. So uh, yeah, I don't see any questions in the Q&A right now. So I encourage you to, uh, to ask your questions if you have one. So uh, in the meantime, to start the discussion, let me uh, ask some questions to the speakers. So uh, yeah, first uh, to in, in order, so to Gorian. Uh, so, um, can you say a bit more about um, uh, the, the assumption that you use, or in what sense you use this assumption, this computational assumption, LWE4, uh, to show that it's impossible to get obfuscation? Can you say a bit more about the statement, what the statement is? Sure. So, um, so we, use, we use kind of two varieties of the, well, actually, there's kind of three assumptions floating around. One is just the... Um, well, two of them are different levels of the LWE assumption. One of them we need because we're going to do uh, quantum fully homomorphic encryption to run this uh, point function homomorphically, right? So remember the circuit counter example has this point function in there and only if you plug in, if you start from an encryption of the special input and homomorphically evaluate that thing, then you get the sort of this encryption of the special output and then you can notice that something interesting happens. So there we need quantum fully homomorphic encryption and the existing, scheme, existing schemes for this uh, require um, LWE, as well as maybe some circular security assumption, but you can get rid of that. Um, the other place where we need the assumption is that um, you know, this checker circuit that at the end, once we're holding the encryption of the special output, we need to check that you know, it really is what, what we hope it is. Uh, so this checker circuit has to actually be also be obfuscated 
inside the example using a classical obfuscator. Um, of course, this obfuscator only works for a very limited class of circuits. So this doesn't violate the impossibility. Uh, but this, this construction also requires LWE. It's like a stronger form of LWE, but yeah. So those are the, so those are the computational assumptions and how they fit in. Does that? Yes, thanks a lot. Okay. Um, so yeah, I see there are some questions in the chat. So it's simpler if people ask questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat. I'll, I'll read the ones in the chat, but for future questions. Uh, Right, so if I may, there is a question uh, for me. Uh, could you explain more how we can use the Quant Conference Key Agreement Protocol? Uh, well, the main use is to make an identical key between you know, 10 users, 20 users, uh, instead of just two users. Does that answer the question? Um, what the advantage is um, over just doing pairwise keys and then XORing them all together to make, uh, to make such a key, um, that advantage comes, for example, in networks, as I just said, because for if you have a, a quantum network, then under some circumstances, you can make a GHZ state very quickly, while it might be very costly to make just bipartite Bell states. So maybe I can actually also ask the question I had myself. So the thing is that as panelists, we cannot write in the Q&A. That's why I was writing it in the chat, uh, Omar. Um, so my question was for Andrea, like what are the requirements for actual implementation of quantum lightning? Uh, so for instance, if you really wanna implement your scheme, then uh, do you have to perform like large coherent uh, preparation of multiple qubits? Yeah, so at, at least for the, the construction that we know, um, so the only concrete construction we have is, is you know, it requires a highly entangled state. And uh, I don't think we expect, uh, I expect it to be possible to, to do it with uh, sort of, you know, product of single qubit states or something like that. Uh, I think or or has a comment about, do, uh, about this. Um, but yeah, so certainly, you know, as far as implementing this, um, it would be, I mean, experimentally very complicated. Uh, so it's nothing that we can expect to do in, in the near future, at least. Okay, let me move on with another question to Omri. So uh, uh, you mentioned T designs for states. So if I understood correctly, you're, you're, uh, you have a new construction of state T designs. Uh, can you say a bit more about that? Yes. Uh, so what we actually uh, do construct is one thing that we call an ARS generator. This is an efficient quantum algorithm that given Oracle access to a random classical function, uh, you can generate a output distribution such that for any polynomial number of copies, it is going to be statistically indistinguishable from the same number of polynomial copies of a truly random quantum state. Now, because this is statistical indistinguishability, we can swap this truly random function f with the two ty's uh, independent classical function. And that, then by the, I think this is a result by Zandri, uh, showing that you can swap the truly random function f with the two ty's independent classical function and get a, a t design. So this, this way we get a T-design for any polynomial number of output copies. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. So we have another question for Gorian. So how much weaker, so yeah, role of, I was asking, how much weaker do you think the notions of quantum obfuscation can be? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure if I exactly understand the question, but maybe, maybe I can make two related comments. I mean, you know, one thing to point out is that like all of these impossibility results, what we're showing is that there exists a particular class of circuits, which is not obfuscatable. So this doesn't rule out that obfuscation is possible for, you know, a large family of very useful circuits for certain applications. Um, and I suppose in principle, that class could be different for classical and quantum. Um, and I think very little is kind of known about that. I mean, I guess one concrete example are these classical obfuscators for computing compare functions, like the ones that we used in our uh, counter example. So that's, so that class is actually obfuscatable, even just classically. 
Um, I guess the other direction maybe to think about is, um, you know, obfuscation of quantum programs. And so there's this weaker notion of indistinguishability obfuscation, which it doesn't ask for this sort of very strong equivalence between analyzing the circuit and just asking the circuit questions. It's some weaker notion, but still, at least in the classical world, apparently very useful. And so one could think about whether whether one can that can exist in the in the quantum setting. Okay, so there are a few questions by the panelists right now. So I see a question, for example, by Fred. So maybe Fred, you can ask your question directly. Yes. So uh, Omri, uh, I was wondering whether this. Uh, so you have a technique for uh, generating uh, uh, state T designs. So I was wondering if it's possible to, uh, to generate unitary T designs using a similar technique somehow. So yeah, great question. Uh, we didn't manage to give a positive, we don't know, we don't know. We don't know how to, to use it uh, for the unitary case, only for states. Okay, so that's a file, to file under open questions, I guess. Yeah, open question, great okay, open thanks. question. Andrea had a question as well. Yeah, it's just yeah. Oh, okay. okay. You got uh, it. I can just read it. So it's a great question. You know, uh, so uh, Andrea is pointing out that in the classical impossibility proof, you don't need to assume anything. And the reason is that you can use, you know, you assume that obfuscation exists. This gives you one way functions. And this turns out to be enough to build kind of a limited form of homomorphic encryption, which you can then use in the counterexample. Um, so we don't know how, that's a great question whether one can do that in the quantum case. Um, we don't know how to pull it off. Yes, because we, we tried hard. Uh, it's a really nice question. I mean, I don't think we ran into any sort of obstacle that says, no, this, this just can't work. Um, but it does seem to require some, some, some new ideas and maybe some new understanding about what, what can and can't be done with uh, QFHE. Uh, yeah, great question. Thanks. So something popped up in the Q&A for me, if I may just take that one. Um, so uh, in the quantum conference key agreement can for- question, please, just uh, Sorry? Yeah, can you just- uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so it says here, may I ask a, a question on quantum conference key agreement? Do all users need to directly connect to a centralized server? Uh, that means Starship and uh, each in the pod, do all inter intermediate nodes still have to be trusted? Also, if users are allowed to be trusted, can Alice Bob 1, Bob 1, 2, and so on only perform n minus 1 instead of n times n minus 1 runs? Sorry, it's a long question. Um, so, um, so what we did is, uh, of course, a direct transmission where, you know, you have a quantum channel that goes from Alice to Bob 1 to Bob 2 to Bob 3. Alice can be separate and there can be a quantum server, but in our case, it's next, it's next to the quantum server. The, the example that I showed at the end and that you're probably referring to, that would be a, you know, some sort of future network uh, where there's lots of intermediate nodes. And then um, it's probably still an open question what the most efficient way would be to make uh, a conference key between an arbitrary number of nodes there because it, it, the connectivity is not necessarily such that you can make a huge set state very quickly. Um, and so the naive example that you always have to have Alice involved in pairwise keys to make a conference key in the end, um, uh, that also doesn't have to be the case. So, you know, you, yes, you can do Bob one, Bob two, Bob two, Bob three, and then sort of make it, try to get, uh, get it to be more efficient. But in the best case, there's certainly an advantage in trying to make a GH set state directly because that can usually be done more quickly depending on the exact connectivity. Um, uh, the question about trust, um, the source doesn't have to be trusted because it's all based on entanglement, but the bobs all have to be trusted. So because each bob will definitely have a, a copy of the key in the end. So, you know, they all need to be authenticated and so on and so forth. Um, um, so this is a little bit different to quantum secret sharing, which also works with a, um, a GHZ state. In quantum secret sharing, though, uh, all the bobs sort of need to come together, uh, and this is meant to sort of weed out uh, a dishonest bob. Other questions from the panelists? Or... Yeah. 
Okay, if not, then uh, let's thank the, the speakers again. And uh, I guess I'll stop here and we have uh, a break right now on meeting. Thanks. Well, in fact, this is the end of, uh, of uh, Monday. So this is the end of the first day of QCrypt. Thanks a lot for attending. Uh, I still ask the speakers of this session to move over to the meet and greet room. And so also can all the attendees can now go there and actually have uh, some final words and, uh, and a chat. And we will start again tomorrow morning, uh, Amsterdam time. The meet and greet room will be open from 10 o'clock. And we'll start the program with more contributed talks at 11 o'clock Amsterdam time. Thank you.